Thank you so much, Fleet, for those great words. So now we're going to go into the uh, next presentation by Mr. Arthur Woods. And this is a really unique thing. We have not done anything quite like this before in any of these forums. So I'm not going to steal the thunder about what he's going to talk about, but I'll tell you it dovetails right on to some of the things that Fleet Whitman talked about. And with that, Arthur, the floor is yours. Thanks, Captain Buziak. Thank you. And thank you, Vice Admiral, for having me here. Uh, Good to see everyone. Did we survive lunch, right? Okay, good, good. Well, I have to start by telling you, um, I was a major disappointment in my family for, for two reasons. And I shared this with the folks in Millington. The first was, I was not a wrestler. Everyone in my family became a wrestler. Most importantly, the second major disappointment was I did not join the Navy. Uh, everyone in my family joined the Navy. I was the one guy that didn't. Um, and my uncle was a master chief, so I, I got to hear about the, the tall tales of the Navy um, and his life in the Navy uh, for years and years, and he still, uh, he actually w was hoping to be here today, he still uh, speaks about it glowingly. So I feel like I, I got to see and, and experience aspects of all that you lead um, really through osmosis, and it, it's been a, a real pleasure to experience it now at Newport and Millington and now here. So thank you for having me today. What we're here today to really talk about um, really gets to the heart of what makes us unique as leaders. And that comes down to not just how we lead and who we lead, but why we lead. Why is it that we come to work every day and come to the Navy? Is it simply just for a paycheck? Is it simply just for the stars that we put on our chest, or is it more? And we had a chance um, at, our, at our organization, Imperative, to do research on that why. To really uncover something that we could share that would get beyond just a fuzzy, cloudy version of how to answer that question. So for me, um, this journey started when I um, was an entrepreneur at a very young age, largely because I couldn't sit still in school. I uh, started my very first company when I was in high school. And work to me was never a means to an end. It was always just an expression of who I was. It was always a way that I could um, become you know, more attuned to whatever I was doing. So my occupation was always a source of passion. I, I entered that normal stage where I had a fear of failure, many of us do, and I decided that the one way that I could be entrepreneurial while being uh, still in, in a secure environment was to work at a place like Google. And so I went off to Google, moved over to Mountain View, and, um, you know, joined Google at a stage when the company was pretty young. I knew Google as a place where you had free bikes, Willy Wonka lunches, uh, the whole nine yards, beanbag chairs, nap pods, if anyone wants to take a nap during lunch, everything that you could ever need at work, right? Um, the happiest place at work. I found, however, that for so many of the people there, especially as we were growing, people were disengaged and unfulfilled because they weren't only there for the perks and benefits. They were there actually because they wanted to make a difference. They wanted to feel like they were part of something they believed in. They wanted to grow and learn even though they had left university. And so we had thousands of people throughout the company who were actually operating at a fraction of their potential. And just to stop and think about this, this is Google. It's supposed to be the utopia of work. Yet people were disengaged and unfulfilled. And as I stepped back, what I realized was the only way to incentivize people to change behavior is not simply just to throw bean bags at them. It's not simply just to give them gourmet lunches. It's actually to think holistically about how we bring out the most in people by getting at that question of what really drives them. For some people, it is the bean bag chairs, and for some people, it is the gourmet lunches. But what I noticed at my colleagues and what I think I've seen within the Navy is there's something more. And we were missing our mark. We were missing the mark completely as the, one of the most resourced organizations in the world. So it caused me actually to, to be inspired to leave Google, to think holistically about how I could answer that question, truly as leaders, how we could bring out the full potential of everyone in the room, starting with ourselves. So I went on an eat, pray, love retreat to Bali to find myself, as many people have done, um, and didn't find myself. But what I, what I did discover was um, I had a new calling. And um, if you go to the next slide, that calling um, came down to meeting my co-founder, um, Aaron Hurst. Aaron founded an organization called Taproot back in 2001, where he built the very first model to engage pro bono professionals, people who would donate their time and their skills to serve the community. What Aaron realized was across the world, thousands of people every day 
donate their time usually by planting a tree or painting a school bench. But the professionals that are out volunteering have extraordinary skill sets that the very nonprofits they're trying to serve oftentimes are missing. So Aaron proposed that we build a marketplace to connect pro bono consultants to those nonprofits. And what he did was he proposed the very first model where you would get someone to do work without paying them or promoting them. As you can imagine, the very first thing he heard from leading employers throughout the world was laughter. They said, Aaron, we'll, we'll stop you right there. There is no way you will get anyone to do anything without paying them or promising them a promotion. It's just the way that work works. And so the first three years, he could not convince anyone to sign up for this model. Finally, I think BMW was one of the very first companies that signed up. They said, okay, we'll humor you. We'll give you a couple thousand professionals. We'll ask them to do the same thing they do in their day jobs, but out in the community for a cause that they believe in. And what do you think happened? It was successful. These professionals came back and said, Aaron, I want to give you a big hug and shake your hand and thank you because the five hours a week that I was doing that pro bono work was so much better than my day job. I was doing the same tasks and responsibilities I do in my day job, but it was something that I believed in. It was something that I felt personally connected to. Can I do this work full time? So for 15 years, Aaron grew this model, um, took it to companies and, and organizations around the world, and really disrupted the traditional incentive model of work. And Aaron at first said, maybe our work here stops. The answer to purpose at work is to send everyone to become a pro bono consultant. Our work here is done, right? And as he thought about it more, he said, you know, we've basically invented Disneyland for work, but we can't live at Disneyland. Only a few creepy people do that. <laughs> so we have to find a way to make all work feel like pro bono work. So Aaron began to ask some really deep questions about what it was about pro bono work that was so rewarding and fulfilling to people. What was it that was activating people? Was it simply finding their philanthropic cause, or was there more? So um, basically what we did is we decided to start our organization um, to research what it was that actually would fulfill people in their daily work, to help organizations and individuals answer this question of how every leader in the room can find their North Star but not just so that it benefits themselves personally, but so that they can truly understand how to motivate and activate their team. By no means does it mean that we, we cease in paying people or promoting people. Those are two very necessary aspects of work. But what about the third bucket, beyond pay and promotion? What about purpose? So what we decided to do was look at some of the leading research in the field that would already help us answer this question of why it is that people come to work if not just to do pro bono work. And what we did is we came across a fascinating study from University of Michigan. Um, two researchers, Amy Wersniewski and Jane Dutton, went in and interviewed people in hospitals. And they simply asked one question. Why is it that you come to work? Why is it that you, as a hospital employee, come to work? What do you think they heard? Help people. That was certainly one. What else do you think they heard? Paycheck, yep. And they had a, there was a third that was basically, you know, a sense of status. I love, you know, being able to tell people that I work in a hospital. Um, so we heard, they heard these three, money, status, and purpose. What they thought would happen is if you were a doctor or a nurse working at the front lines, it would likely be that you're there to impact patients, right? It seems pretty straightforward. They actually found, sadly, that there were a number of doctors and nurses, about a third, that were primarily there for a paycheck, right? Um, there were another third that were primarily there for status. But what was most interesting was they went down to the blue collar hospital janitors who they believed were simply just there at work because they had to be, right? And what they learned was for an entire portion of them, over a third of hospital janitors, said the primary reason they are there to work is for purpose. They didn't simply tell people they were there to sweep the floors or clean up blood. What they told themselves and other people was they were there to help patients get better by creating a safe patient experience, right? A clean, safe patient experience. They learned that these hospital janitors went out of their way to serve as translators between doctors and patients that didn't speak the same language. They went out of their way to tell jokes to grieving patients and their families. And they went so far as to rotate paintings in the long-term care units where a patient had to stare at the same wall every day. 
So these purpose-driven hospital janitors were meeting the mission of the hospital with a sense of personal agency to make their work more fulfilling. And you know, when we saw this study, we stepped back and asked, how is it that we could make everyone, we could help everyone in the workforce have that level of agency and awareness to make their work better? And especially for us in the room as leaders, what is it that we could do to manage our teams and our departments so that we activated everyone at that level? I love the, the idea of the mule. How can we get everyone to become a mule because they have so much personal ownership of their work? They have such a personal connection to their work. They see themselves in the work that they're doing. We've all been in that place where we feel such a sense of ownership in what we're doing. We also all know the times when we haven't. Vividly, you can see it across the board. I vividly remember the times when I've been disengaged in my work. How is it that we can help everyone become activated? So that was the critical question. And what we decided to do then is tell a new story about purpose that would help us debunk the common myths and misconceptions that we've found truly are haunting this question of what is purpose. The first is many people who believe the only way to find one's purpose is to engage in a cause. And in the Navy, that may be um, the only way to find purpose is to go work at the front lines on the mission, right? It can't be found behind the scenes. It can't be found um, in any sort of work that isn't mission critical. Um, if you're on the front lines engaged in that cause or that mission, you are finding purpose. And what we found to the counter of this is that people can find purpose. They can find that sense of ownership in any line of work. In Millington, I had a chance to meet dozens and dozens of people who served as CEOs and then had switched roles to actually be working in personnel. And it was very cool to see that they were finding just as much enrichment by not working at the front lines as they were working behind the scenes to support the people who are working at the front lines. I thought that was really cool. That we can find our purpose anywhere. It's a North Star that stays with us wherever we go. We bring it to life wherever we are. And it has nothing to do with simply just being at the front lines working on the cause. The next one is a lot of people who have believed that purpose is only found in this revelation, right? This one time only, you know, experience in life, maybe when I become an officer, or maybe, you know, at that one time when I've sort of discovered who I am. Instead, to really reframe this question is purpose not being the, the destination, but actually the journey to get there. That as leaders, we constantly peel back layers on the onion to determine what our purpose is. And as we gain maturity, as we gain awareness, we have a more and more refined answer to this question. The admirals that I've met have some of the greatest self-awareness because they've peeled back so many layers. It's, it's what makes them incredible leaders. The final one that we hear constantly is that purpose is a luxury. And the only way to find it is if you are a, a very senior officer or if you've achieved the highest possible accolades and then you can finally worry about your self-actualization. Um, instead, it is truly, folks, at every level of the organization, every level of the Navy, that can connect to purpose. And if the hospital janitor story isn't enough, um, you know, Viktor Frankl, who wrote A Man's Search for Meaning, if anyone's had a chance to read that book, wrote that purpose ultimately in, in the Holocaust is what helped him to survive. The ability to choose how to react to that situation is what gave him that sense of meaning. So as we look at every single person we manage, from the very most junior entry level doing some of the most, you know, the grunt, the, the, the most grunt work that we can imagine, um, every single person has the ability to discover a sense of personal meaning in their work. And oftentimes, as leaders, we learn that folks um, can, can sort of cast off those who are, are not senior um, in the belief that they're not able to achieve this. So when we tie that all together, purpose is a choice. It's possible in any job, at any level. Um, and it's a continuous discovery process. As leaders, we have the responsibility, first and foremost, to discover this for ourselves. But we then have this opportunity to really enable it for our team. And the way that we ultimately have to define it is all centered around the idea that we will certainly pay people and promote people, but purpose is the reason we work beyond those two things. I live in Manhattan. I'll tell you, it's one of the most expensive cities in the world. Um, I'm a huge proponent of paying people to work. <laughs> Um, I'm also a huge proponent of g everyone having a sense of identity. There's a lot of pride that comes in the roles that, that are in this, in this organization. But there's something more 
that motivates people beyond those two. And we've defined the culture of work really as being about money and status. We have the chance to go beyond. One of the things that's also interesting about this journey of purpose is we each have our own individual purpose. And though we work for, everyone in this room is working for an organization with a very strongly articulated purpose and mission that is, is seen and heard around the world. Every single person in the room has a different personal connection to what that is and what it means for them personally. And so what I'm proposing today is for us to think about questions for ourselves so that we can think about questions for our teams. We each have this individual purpose that governs us, this individual North Star that informs who we are and why we're here. And if we harness that, we really are unstoppable. Um, when I've had a chance to talk to CEOs um, who have talked either about their dysfunctional ships or their thriving ships, it seems to be the critical distinction between the, between the ones that were dysfunctional and the ones that were thriving came down to culture. It came down to culture. Could I create a culture where everyone was a unit, where everyone felt connected to what they were doing, everyone was communicating? I really believe that the critical path to creating that culture is helping everyone figure out what their why is, helping everyone answer that critical question. And the question is really hard. To be honest with you, I've, I've worked with executives across the board who uh, I've seen crippled by this question of what is your purpose? If you ever want to see executives or leaders uh, really sort of clench up when asked a question, that's the question to ask because it sounds extremely difficult to answer. Yet we have a framework that can help each person in the room answer this question really effectively, at least get us to a first draft of an answer that we can build on. And most importantly, that we can begin to take to our teams. And I hope as a result of today it can help us reframe that conversation so when we are looking at the way to intrinsically drive someone, the, the way to intrinsically activate someone, we can use that framework as a very easy reference. So we believe that as leaders, we can't begin to inspire and motivate our colleagues if we ourselves are not inspired and motivated. And um, I'm on a plane a lot these days. I get to hear the, uh, the, the safety announcement at the beginning of every flight. Um, and I'm numb to it. Like, if, if the plane ever goes down, I'm never going to really know what to do because I've, I've, like, it's, I've, it's in, in one ear and out the other. But the one piece that I can tell you I do remember is to put your oxygen mask on first before helping others. I'll always remember that. And it's the greatest lesson I think we can learn as leaders, to put your oxygen mask on first before helping others. We tend to think about, first and foremost, how to motivate our teams, and we tend to not turn the lens back onto ourselves to ask, how do we motivate ourselves? So I encourage you today to start by putting your oxygen mask on first before helping others. And in this exercise, um, to answer these questions for you so that they're so much more easy to answer for your team. Um, for us, purpose starts with discovering what your why is, figuring that out, articulating it, working on it, sharing it with the people you care about and you work with closely. And then as leaders, acting on it. Because as we all know, it can be very lonely at the top. It can be very difficult to constantly be self-developing when you're worried about developing everyone else. Then we believe it's really possible to inspire and empower because you're not going to folks only talking about them. You're norming that behavior based on what matters to you. You're telling them why you're here and signaling to them that it's a safe place for them to talk about why they're here. So, what we're going to start by doing today um, is I'm going to give you a really, really easy framework to answer this question of what is my North Star. And I know that sounds kind of unsurmountable in an in a, you know, hour-long conversation, but I promise you we'll get to this answer. One of the things that's, uh, that's cool is, um, thanks to the great coordination of, of, the, of the folks behind this event, um, we're actually able to get everyone in the room a purpose profile that actually is an assessment that helps you answer this question. So if you're really interested in sort of validating what you come up with here organically, you're going to have access to a 27-page report that can help you answer this much more, uh, much more sort of systematically. Um, so we'll be, uh, th I think the, the link has already been shared. It's going to be pushed out um, today. You'll have access to that. That's a nice, uh, great resource to sort of bring this to life, something you can actually use with your teams. So the first aspect that what we learned in our research around how we gain purpose after studying over 100,000 people globally, 
uh, doing a ton of research uh, with companies like LinkedIn and New York University, we learned that everyone gains purpose based first and foremost on where they believe their work, work creates an impact. Here at the Navy, there are folks in the room as leaders who are driven by changing individual lives. There's nothing more fulfilling and rewarding than you impacting the lives of a sailor, you impacting lives of a community member. It's the people you can point to. There are other folks in the room, other leaders, who are driven by the idea of creating change at the organizational level. That could be the command, the warfare community, but it's all about serving the collective. You as a leader create a ripple effect every day. Finally, you have folks in the room who are driven by the big mission of the Navy. It could be the global impact, the ability to create safety and security around the world, but for you it's the big picture. So what I want to do is I want to I brief you on these three, the distinction between the three, and I want you to think about as a leader, what are you gravitating towards personally? Um, you could say all three, but there's one that probably stands out, and as you really think about the most fulfilling moments for you personally as a leader, when you feel like you've really experienced a great level of meaning, what, what really has stood out to you? So if you go to the first one, as individually driven leaders, um, we remember the names and faces of the people we serve. We have a level of empathy because for us, it's all about every person uniquely, uniquely valuable, right? We actually love to work at the front lines with people. Um, as leaders, individually driven leaders are great coaches. They're great mentors. There's nothing like that one-on-one -on -one impact, right? You are a person who doesn't just think of your ship or a, of, your, of your team as, as, as a unit, but you think about each of the people that makes it up. And that really is special because every person brings something unique. As you know, every person changes the chemistry of the whole, right? So individually driven leaders actually love pretty consistent feedback. They love, they love the idea of working in a hands-on way. When they're working far be, be behind the scenes, especially as you're you know, scaling up and, and doing you know, much more kind of system level leadership, um, you oftentimes can feel removed from that direct impact and you'll put yourself on the front lines to experience it. So that's the litmus test is when you feel removed from that direct impact and you really want to get your hands dirty and make sure you're back experiencing you know, that individual direct impact. How many people feel like they resonate with that? Like that's, that's, I'm, I'm describing you. Okay, cool. It's like a third. The next group up is our organizational leaders. And these are the folks who say, you know, I care about the people. I certainly do. But I'm thinking about people in the collective. I'm thinking about all of the people we serve, the system we create to serve everyone. For me, it is the command or the warfare unit. It's the, it's the ability to impact the lives of many. And as a leader, I love to create that ripple effect, right? These Organization-driven leaders oftentimes have come from team sports where they had a great sense of belonging. Many of them came from big families or, in my case, small families um, where they, they always thrived in group-level settings where they could experience what it was like to have that connection to others, right? So there oftentimes really is a, is a reason you're, you're driven by this because you experience kind of a team-level impact early on. For you, there's nothing as rewarding as seeing your team kick it out of the park your team win, your team hit its goals, right? Seeing the, the unit, the organization working together. When the organization is dysfunctional as an organization-driven leader, there's nothing more frustrating. This is a real source of pain and, and, and challenge when you're seeing folks not working together, not creating some level of, dare I say, synergy. So organization-driven folks, for you it's about the collective. How many folks felt like they resonated with that one? That was kind of me, you, okay. Finally, we have our societal-driven folks, and these guys and, 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 and ladies feel that the Navy is about the big picture mission and vision, and for you, it's about feeling part of something that you really stand for and believe in. You're thinking in terms of the movement that's here, you're thinking in terms of how you, um, you know, are impacting the lives of many every day, you're thinking about the work that's being done even in an incremental level in terms of how it's serving communities around the world. And this big picture could just be your, your general belief in the Navy and what, what it stands for. It also could just be that you love to feel like there's some longer term, bigger picture direction that's all behind this work, right? But you are a visionary leader as a societal driven person. You're, you're someone who, you know, helps people sort of see the forest through the trees. And that's a huge opportunity because most folks especially in their daily work, are you know, in, in myopia. You help people see 
what's out there, right? You help people connect to the bigger why. Um, societal driven folks oftentimes saw a level of disparity uh, early on or, or inequity early on and it caused them to think bigger about their core why, about you know, sort of what they would be doing and why they would be doing it. Um, so we find that our societal scale folks are oftentimes um, you know, coming from those early life experiences where they can really relate to you know, folks that don't have everything or areas where there, aren't, there isn't a sense of equality and you might see your work as truly addressing that. So how many folks felt like they were kind of more of the big picture society? Okay, okay, cool. So we had a few. So it looks like we had a lot of individually driven folks. So what I'd like you to do really quickly is turn to the person next to you and, and share what, it, what of those three do you feel like really stood out to you? Do you feel like individual driven leader, organization or society? And where do you think that's showing up right now in your work in the Navy? Where, do you, where are you seeing this come up? So we'll just, we'll just spend you know, 60 seconds talking to your neighbor. Chris, which one were you again? Your, your society, yeah, yeah. He mentioned that, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, you're doing great. Thanks, kids. Okay. All right, we're going to bring it in. So it's a rapid sharing. <laughs> cool. We can go to the next one. So uh, would anyone be willing to share or put, uh, most importantly, put your neighbor on the spot because that always helps, right? Um, any, any, anyone, any two had, have the same? Where you said, okay, cool, we're good, good thing we're sitting next to each other? Cool. Okay. Um, did anyone hear just a, an example of, of where this is coming to life in the way that you're leading that, that resonated, even if you're putting your neighbor on the spot? Do you want to put your neighbor on the spot? <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah. That's great. So as a recruiter, it, what you're leading in recruiting is, is very much on that individual level. Correct. Got it. Anyone that was at the societal level who's, who thought that they, they really resonated more with society and they could see kind of the big picture connection to the work? <laughs> Less society in the room. That's okay. We'll come back to that one. So um, this is a re the, the who you impact is a really important one. And again, what we're finding is the one that you gravitate towards likely doesn't change significantly as you change levels and functions. This ought to make sense just as much in 10 years as it does today. So getting a chance to feel like where, where I personally connect and gravitate, um, there, there's a lot of opportunity to, to, to uncover that because it will make just as much sense in 10 years. The second area that we focused on was all centered around what you stand for as a leader. And what we found was you could split the world almost completely evenly between two sides, what we call karma versus harmony. And what's really interesting is out of the 300 plus rooms I've been in over the last couple of years, um, there's been an even split between these two in nearly every room. So this really sticks out. Um, the first is leaders in the room who are all centered around the idea that we create fairness and equality, um, which we call harmony. And as harmony-driven leaders, for you, there's nothing like building consensus. There's nothing like leveling the playing field and ensuring that every single person you're managing has opportunities. No one's left out. No voice is unheard. You lead by consensus. You lead by uh, creating a place for everyone. 
And you know, if you think about the Navy for a minute, one of the things that's so amazing is regardless of where you've come from or who you are or what your family name is or where your parents went to college, you have an opportunity here. The Navy levels the playing field and creates opportunity for everyone, right? Um, and for you as a leader, that's something you, maybe for, as a harmony-driven leader you connect to. That the, the Navy has equity for everyone. And as a harmony-driven leader, we learn that you notice when people are left out. Um, you like to actually have everyone around the table um, to have input into decisions. And you don't want to create a ton of hierarchy. You're actually more interested in everyone feeling a sense of personal belonging. So your, your inclusion um, and ensuring that everyone has a voice is a big part of the way that you might naturally lead. So this is, this is a really important one, especially given, I think, the model of the Navy. The second area um, is what we call karma, and this is the yin of that yang. Karma is all about unearthing potential and realizing opportunity. Karma says, you know what, yes, the Navy gives you opportunity, but you have to work at it. What you put in is what you will get out. So karma has a meritocratic approach to leadership, which is all about investing in unrealized potential and ensuring that that potential is, is realized, helping people thrive and realize their greatest potential. So as leaders, karma-driven leaders exercise what we consider to be the 80-20 rule. You find the 20% who might deliver 80% of the value and you invest in them, right? But it's all about unearthing potential. There's nothing more fulfilling as a karma-driven leader than knowing that you've created a new opportunity, that you've advanced, right? And that you've invested in people who um, can spread their wings. So as we, as we think about those two, how many folks feel more connected to harmony as the way that they lead or the way, the way that they sort of think, okay? And how many folks feel more connected to karma? Okay, a lot of karma, all right. Um, and usually, uh, you know, again, uh, one of the things that we, we've done is we've seen the absolute versions of these. In a, in a world with only harmony, there is no competition. There's no real way of anyone ever getting ahead. So it's just sort of nonsense. And in the absolute, you know, karma, um, where everything is about sort of competition and advancement, it becomes like the Hunger Games. So you really see that you need, the, you need both of these worlds. And as leaders, you, there's one that you might gravitate towards most but one that you, the other, you should actually be able to situationally lead, right? Um, I, I'll tell you, as someone who's more driven by karma, um, I've learned that I have to really lean into harmony to bring my team along. Because my knee-jerk reaction is get it done, let's like go realize that next potential, and I don't really bring people along with me. And my team has very humbly reminded me that I need to, right? Like, hey, wait about, what, you know, what about us? You need to stop, right? So as leaders, a question for you is where do you feel like you naturally fall in karma versus harmony and which one do you need to exercise at times because your team is going to need you to do both, right? The final area um, is all centered around your superpowers as a leader. The way that you show up every day based on how you serve. The question is now how do you serve? What makes you unique in terms of the way that you lead every day? What we learned is there are four ways that we show up every day as leaders that come down to what makes us special and what gives us our unique abilities. One of the things that we found that's really critical about this is if we, have, if we are removed from this way of leading, we are not our best leaders. We're not, we're not at our best in the way that we're supporting and empowering others. So the first area um, is all centered around the idea of human-centered leadership. Human-centered leaders lead with empathy. The way that you lead is by putting yourself in the shoes of the people you lead. It's not just about the systems. It's not just about the mission. It's about those you're actually serving, those you're actually leading. And you understand their needs, and you lead in a way that deeply helps them thrive, um, empowers them to be at their best because you know them. So human-centered leaders um, are the experts in the people they're actually leading. And this is really, really, really critical because I've met so many leaders who are so far removed from the people they serve, they don't know their names, they don't know anything about them, right? As a, as a, as a human-centered leader in the Navy, you know everything about the people that you lead. You could tell us everything that, that they need, everything that they want, everything that they shouldn't have, right? And um, that's your secret sauce, is, is, is really the experts in, in, in who they are. 
The next wave is community-driven leaders, and you lead through empowerment. For you, there's nothing more fulfilling than empowering your people to actually be the ones leading. Um, you're all about delegating, about ensuring that your people feel just as much ownership in the work as you do, and you're all about bringing the team together. So as community-oriented leaders, you're relationship builders. You connect people, you connect the team, you, you rally the team together. And there's nothing more fulfilling and rewarding for, for, for you than seeing people working together and seeing your team own the solution. Not just you, but them. The next wave is structure driven. And you're leaders who lead through process. You want repeatability and scale. You want to create systems that work for everyone, that, that address problems head on and don't see problems repeat themselves. As structure driven leaders, um, you might be list people. You create, um, you know, you create a true method of repeatability to ensure that you're leading uh, in a way that will be effective, right? That, that can serve many. And finally, we have knowledge-driven leaders. Um, and knowledge-oriented leaders or knowledge-driven leaders are all about um, unearthing insights, having the right direction because you have the right information. And as inquisitive knowledge-driven leaders, there's nothing more rewarding for you than knowing the answers, having the answers, and having the right strategy and direction because you know where you're going, right? So knowledge-oriented leaders um, are usually able to get a lot of context up front, a lot of data up front, and they have the patience to do a deep dive and understand everything there is to possibly know so that they make really informed decisions. So of those four, my question for you is, how many folks feel personally really connected to human-centered leadership, Under, being the expert, the empathy expert in your, your, your crew? Uh, how about community-oriented, uh, working through empowerment, empowering your team? Okay. How about structure? Process, structure, cool. Okay. All the structure folks are like, let's meet over here. Um, and then finally, knowledge oriented, right? Okay. So we actually have an even split of all, all four of those, which is great. My question for you to your neighbor is, what, what's one way that you feel like you've led with that driver in your, in your current role? What's one way that you've led with human-centered leadership, community oriented, structure driven, or knowledge oriented? Just give one example. This is one that's probably so core to who you are that it's kind of like second nature. It's like that's kind of what I do every day. But just give your partner, your, 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 your neighbor, one quick example of what you think, one way that you've led with this in, in your work, in this role. Human, yeah. Okay, cool. Let's let's bring it back. Would anyone be willing to put their neighbor on the spot and share one one uh, one area where you feel like you've led with this? One example. Human. We had a lot of structure driven. This is. This, let's start with there. That's an easy one. What what's for the for the structure crowd here that all all convened in the middle? Uh, what what's one example where you've seen sort of a structured approach to leadership come out in the way that the way that you've approached your role right now? We're all shy. Structure and folks are shy. It's true. It's a good point. They're like, that's an important attribute. <laughs> Any, anyone who's led with process or, or you know, led, led with a, a repeatability, we, we, could, we could learn from? And it's popping up? Oh, yeah. Here, I'll pop, pop over here. Here, I'll give you my. Oh, I was adjusting my glasses. Oh, sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Good reason. 
<laughs> yeah. No, no, don't wear glasses. Uh, well, I'm not a structure driven, but FC1 is structure driven. <laughs> and <laughs> so I'll share hers. Um, so she recently just went to Swarmic and they were completely kind of. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. They were lacking structure. So, and as she is supremely fantastic at that, she, 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 I, she has shown that she can bring that to the table and kind of itemize things. You know, just sometimes lists solve your problems. List. So, yeah. Okay. Not to not to say Swarmic was you know, but you know. Oh, m my driver is human-centered, so I, oh, well, like you said, it's kind of second nature for me, so I just, that's what I look for in my day. I, like, walk around, and I'm like, who's down? Who needs a pep talk? Who needs to find their purpose here? Because I think that every sailor, even though they think they have nothing to offer or the Navy has nothing to offer them, they do. They just have to find their niche, so I try to help my sailors find their niche, so, yeah. Thanks. That was... Two for the price of one. That's great. Thank you. Thank you both. So um, this, I think to your point, is very second nature. And, you know, it's interesting. When leaders, we learn, are not leading in alignment with this how driver, um, they're really oftentimes just at a loss. And it's, it's a travesty. It's, it's basically like, you know, practice for a second writing, writing with the hand you don't write with, right? If you have something in front of you, you're just pretending to write. And it would be like leading that way every day if you're, not, if you're not working in alignment with this driver. How awful would it be if we have to write a full paper every day with the wrong hand, right? Um, and that really comes down to how we authentically lead with purpose is it's not natural for us to be removed from these drivers. It's who we are at our core. It's where we've come from. It's what we stand for. And when we're not leading in alignment with these drivers, it's not only to the detriment of ourselves personally, but it's to the detriment of our teams and what we're working on in the Navy. Um, unfortunately, what I learned and what we've learned is that throughout the world, the vast majority of people in their daily work are in, in, in a lack of alignment with these drivers. They don't feel a personal connection to their work in a way that's meaningful to them. They tend to say that they only can experience that connection outside of work and on the weekends, or one day maybe in retirement. Um, and that's what, as leaders, we have a chance to really change every day for our teams. We certainly will continue to pay people. We'll we will certainly continue to promote them. But what more can we do to motivate them? One of the things that we can do right now with this that I think every, in the, every leader in the room can take as a, a bit of a call to action is to put these results into words that matter to you as a leader. So what I would encourage you to do this week, because this is a great week where CDS has come together and created this really amazing space for you to reflect and connect, right? And any, any other X, um, is to think about drafting your own personal mission statement. Um, in some of the training programs in the Navy, this has been called like a vision statement. But drafting your personal mission statement, which I would consider to be your North Star. This North Star should make just as much sense in 10 years as it does today. It's not about your existing role and your responsibilities. It's not what was written in your job description. It's not about um, what the person managing you says you should be doing. It's about who you are at your core, what you stand for, and the impact you want to have. And so what you can do from the three things that you just uncovered and reflected on is build a statement that says, first of all, um, I am working to impact blank. So this is like a game of Mad Libs to help them do blank, which could be level the playing field or create, you know, unearth opportunity, um, by, by doing the following, and that is your, your, your how driver, right? So who is it that you want to serve? Why do you want to serve them? And then how are you serving them, right? And if you could craft this into a statement, that would be just as much relevant in 10 years as it is today. You have this constant thing you can check yourself for as a leader, right? This constant thing you can ask, am I leading in alignment with this every day? And if I'm not, if I'm disengaged and unfulfilled and not inspired, this is something you can go back to, right? Are you working in alignment with your personal mission statement? What I learned in this process um, for me, myself personally was I've changed jobs from places like Google, consulting, now what I'm doing today. I've always been interested in a collective level impact, unearthing potential, and building community. Anything that I ever do in the future as a leader will have those three things. I know it. 
I just know it. So it's really nice to know, um, to be able to articulate that. Because so much will change, but I know those things will not. It's even more powerful if you can help your team answer those questions. So I want to leave you with a couple things you can bring to your team to help them frame these questions. And the next time you're managing someone and you're seeing them start to struggle with some of these, these might be some ways that you can actually um, help lift them up. So the first thing is that each of your team members has drivers just as much as you do. They're not going to be the same as yours. They're not going to be uh, necessarily um, all the same as each other's, but every person has these drivers. Every person has a scale of impact they're trying to create, something they stand for, and unique superpowers. And as a leader, I can tell you, if you can, answer, if you can help your team answer these questions, or if you can anticipate what the answers are even before you have this conversation, you are knocking it out of the park. Seriously, that is like the black belt of leadership to be able to anticipate these questions. It's, it's the blue belt, which I think call, comes right before the black belt, to even have the questions in mind. Most leaders don't know these questions. Most, most leaders never touch on these things. Most leaders aren't self-aware enough to answer the questions for themselves. So you've done the first step, which is answer the questions for you. Step number two is help your team answer them as well. So here they are. The first is, who is it that you're trying to serve every day? If you can go up to your team member and understand, are they on the ground interested in that individual level impact, or are they thinking bigger picture as to why the work at the Navy matters? What is their core why, right? What is the core group they're trying to serve? Um, where do you see them most energized? They might really love that hands-on direct impact, or it maybe is the bigger picture story. You can help them answer that. The second is, what, what do they stand for? What do they care about? Do you hear your team talking about what is not fair because someone's left out or because so-and-so got something that someone else didn't get? Or are you hearing them talk more about work ethic and pushing forward to the next, the next frontier? You can start to decipher why someone is doing the work that they're doing, what they believe is valuable, what they think is the core value of their work. You can help them connect to that. Finally, a very easy one for us to think about and see in our team members is what do you think are the superpowers of the people you manage? When do you see them at their best because of the way that they're working? And when are you seeing people feel misaligned, right, when they're doing work that isn't realizing any great potential? Or when they're feeling underutilized or undervalued, right? You can start to ask someone, what are you really, where are you at your best? What are you really good at? What are your unique powers? Okay, the combination of these three gives you that same answer, right? That same set of answers that your team can go through. So I really encourage you to first start by doing that purpose statement for yourself, getting to that North Star, and share it with someone who knows you well. And ask, does this feel like me? Does this seem like me? Does this seem like me at my core as a leader? Then take the questions to your team. And even in the most casual way, you could start to answer these questions with your team. Who do you want to serve? What do you stand for? What are your powers? If you can do that, you're set up to really motivate people in a whole new way and understand what you really share together. When you um, get access to this purpose profile, if you request it, um, you'll see a whole series of tools for, uh, for you and your team as, as leaders that you can take advantage of. Part of it is that we don't want this to feel like it's a flavor of the month, but we want you to continue to you know, be able to sort of touch on this because as leaders, this is a constant discovery process. I'm still working on this five years in to having reflected on these things. It's constantly peeling back more and more layers, right? And as leaders, I think we, we will continue to feel that way. Um, I, wa uh, I want to leave you with uh, a couple calls to action here um, that really hopefully will help you take this to your team. The first is find someone closest to you and share that purpose statement. You have, a, you have a draft of it in your head now, or on, on the paper in front of you, or if you were taking, I saw a few folks taking pictures. We'll make sure that we get you this deck so you don't get carpal tunnel. Um, share that purpose statement. I think one of the most powerful things I've heard as leader, from leaders, especially in the Navy in Newport and Millington, was people not just sharing what that statement was, but why they had it. You know, Someone being able to say that, I am interested in societal scale impact because at an early age I saw that the world was not fair, right? Or, you know, I'm interested in serving teams because I came from teams where I had a great sense of belonging and I know what that's like and I also know what it's not like. But as leaders, your ability to storytell and inspire your team by telling something that's authentic to who you are 
not just about the work that you're doing right now, but who you are at your core, that's the most powerful way you can inspire anyone. And it doesn't have to start from scratch. It can start from a framework that everyone can react to. Have a conversation with a team member and help them think about what these drivers might be. There might be someone on your team right now who you feel is really struggling. And you, you see that they have potential, but it's not really being realized. And they're either feeling like they're, they don't understand why the work that they're doing matters. They're feeling misaligned between the work that they're doing and what they're capable of doing. Use this as a framework to, to, to get them on the right track. Help become their coach right now. You know, you, you have a knowledge of this for yourself. Help them gain that same knowledge. Help them see that they're realizing their potential matters to you. Finally, um, coach them in bringing those drivers to life. The answer to those three questions, if there's a misalignment between what they're doing and who they are, then you have a chance to bridge that. I'll end simply by saying that um, in all of our research, when we ask someone really what they stand for, and what matters to them, they tend to bring up examples of leaders who inspired them at a certain stage to be a better self, a better version of themselves. It's usually mentors or managers or people who really saw their potential and believed in them. And I love that we're able to always pinpoint who are in our lives. And my question for you with your teams is how are you going to be the person that your team members reference? Later on when they're reflecting, and they're saying that so-and-so is who helped me realize my potential, helped me discover my purpose, helped me realize who I, what I could really do and who I could really serve. How can we be those leaders for the people we serve? Thank you. So we've got a minute or two for a couple quick questions, if there are any. Are there, are there any questions from the crowd for... All right, come on up to the mic up here. Good afternoon. Um, H. Mon Aquino with Naval Hospital at Camp Pendleton. As we know, being a government entity versus a corporate one, we differ vastly in how we operate. Most of our younger sailors are driven by extrinsic motivation, which is temporary, versus most upper level corporate, which are driven by intrinsic motivation. How can we find the drive to intrinsically motivate our sailors with mundane tasks? For example, as lab techs, we operate in a routine mundane work. What's your take on that, Mr. Woods? Great question. So I, I want to do just a really quick poll here. How many folks feel in the room feel like your junior sailors um, are, are purely driven by extrinsic motivators, money, status? How many folks feel like they know, they know junior sailors who, who are driven by intrinsic motivation? OK. Um, and this is actually a question we get quite a bit, um, and it goes into the luxury category, um, which is really, do we believe that people on the ground doing grunt work are really only there because they have to be? And as leaders, do we really believe that there are folks on the ground who are driven by more than that? So I think first and foremost is to overcome that, that myth that um, you have all walks of life at every level, at every type of work, driven by everything imaginable. You have people at the very top who are st status and money driven. We saw that there were doctors that were status and money driven. And there are people doing grunt work who are driven by more, right? So I think first and foremost, it is acknowledging that um, you know, across the board, we'll, ha we'll have all types of motivation, right? Um, second, it, and I think it's a really important question that comes up a lot, is how do we help people who are early on in their careers doing that grunt work understand why it matters? And I'd love to hear thoughts here on, on what people have, 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 have seen and heard. But I, I'll tell you, um, when I talk to officers, what they always talk about where they really built character was early on when they understood what it really meant to do that type of work. They saw that there was no you know, way to cut corners and fast track to, to becoming an officer. You had to do it. You had to understand what it really meant to do that work, to understand how everything worked together so that you would one day be able to empathize with the people you're managing who are doing it now today. And so I think part of it is you communicating to them why it matters and where it's going. You're not going to have to do this forever, but you're doing it now. And here's why it's important. We all are in a system together, and we all have a contribution to make. And, as a you know, and I think as a leader, being able to help people make that logical connection, and I'll give you an example, really kind of simple example. A lot of times what you hear people say is that in those junior roles, you're laying bricks. 
every day you're laying bricks. How is it as a leader that you help people realize that when they're laying bit bricks, they're building a cathedral? I know that if I was laying bricks simply, I wouldn't be that motivated, but if I knew what it was building, I would be. It's not about changing the work, it's about changing the narrative of why it matters. And as a leader, you are uniquely positioned to help them realize that, right? Because you've been there. And I think you're also positioned to help them realize that you are also there and look what you're doing now. I started there as well. Here, I understand what you're going through. This is why the work that you're doing now matters, and this is where it's going, right? I think that's the narrative that you have the chance to, 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 to uncover, right, and share with them. Great question. Other Any questions? other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, Mr. Thank Lewis. you. Thanks, Kevin.